Okay, it's nine o'clock in Belgium and 15 o'clock in China. Good morning and good afternoon, dear participants, dear professors. We meet each other again in the clouds. Here is the main venue of the third China-Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium, day two. So you're sitting in the session five Forum of Young Scientists. I'm Chen Kai from ACPB and the host of this session. For session four, climate change, you might have to switch to another meeting ID, so here. For session six and the closing ceremony, you may stay here. The two sessions will start later here in the same room. Now let's start our session officially. So Forum of Young Scientists is a podium for the collaboration between Belgian and Chinese universities and the talent development. This session is new this year in the China-Belgium Science and Technology Exchange Symposium because we have realized that the young talents who has who have strong education and research backgrounds in both Belgium and China will be the core of the scientific collaboration between the two nations in the near future. Therefore, we set up this forum for young scientists and to invite them already in the spotlight on the stage. So in addition, we are going to discuss during the roundtable interview on a role model of collaboration between universities and talent development. So there are two bullets on today's agenda. The first bullet is the keynote talks by five professors, five presenters. They are on the screen, uh, Professor Wang Jun, Professor Qian Junbin, Professor Yuan Qiang, Professor Zhang Qilu and Professor Zhang Zhiyue. They are all rising stars in the research fields covering from biology, medical sciences, civil engineering, chemistry, and the pharmaceutical sciences. So now the first, now the first, uh, I'm going to stop, okay. So now the first keynote speaker is Professor Wang Jun. Pro Professor Wang had studied as a master student in Ghent University uh, around 2009, 2010, till 2012, something like that. Then he uh, went to Germany he got his PhD in Max Planck's Institute for Evolutionary uh, Biology. Uh, after he got his PhD, he returned back to, De uh, to, to Be Belgium, uh, working as a postdoc by VIB uh, Kajo Leuven. And then he joined uh, the Institute of Microbiology, um, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. So Professor Wan is now a principal investigator uh, with research interest in bioinformatics tools and computational methods for health and disease related bio, uh, microbiome. So the topics of to, uh, his talk today is on the screen, the data-driven microbiome research in human health. So Professor Wang, the stage is yours. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks for this kind introduction. Uh, hello everyone. It is uh, a pleasure to meet many of you again after a long time of, uh, uh, well, after like a really long while after Ghent and uh, Leuven. And uh, uh, in Beijing, I also have worked for around five years on my group. And uh, uh, here are some of our research points that I'd like to share with you and discuss. So the idea of uh, our research is so-called data-driven microbiome. And uh, why do we study microbiome or the microbes in our body well from an evolutionary perspective the evolutionary history of microbiome actually long succeed 
or exceeds our own evolutionary history, the world has been for the majority of the part microbial. And even after the development or the evolution of eukaryotes, like human, animals, plants, they still participate in a large part of our physiological progress and uh, health. For instance, the bacteria in our guts help us to uh, digest the food, uh, keep our immunological system uh, stable. And if they go, uh, if something goes wrong or so-called dysbiotic disease would occur. Uh, in the last 10 years, it has become a very hot topic in biology because uh, the tool in uh, sequencing and other omics, and we start to learn the importance of those uh, systems. It got so popular that uh, even some of the pop culture, like South Park, picked those uh, things up. And uh, from uh, our own research perspective, why do we care about uh, the health and disease? Well, it is really affect our own uh, succession of uh, humankind and the human race. That's why medicine has uh, always been a major research topic or field in biology. So what about our group or what do we do? We have a very strong focus on methodological improvements or advances, especially under the, well, so sort of the hint or the suggestions from Sidney uh, um, Brainer that usually the uh, new technology brings new data. And then uh, from new data, we start to look at the new biological questions and uh, try to answer them. Uh, I'm going to give a few examples in the next few minutes. So what we do uh, in our group. So the first is to observe, to understand what is there. So what is in this kind of complex communities and uh, why do we care about uh, their differences? Well. In the last 10 years, as I mentioned, the microbiome research, as well as I, many other fields in biology, has been the product or the, been the beneficiary of uh, uh, next generation sequencing technology. For instance, the MySeq I put there, and before that, we also start, we also use the 454. But now we have a newer generation, so called third or the, as a single molecule uh, real time um, uh, sequencer. Um, uh, exemplified by Nanopore and Pegabil. We focus on the usage and application of Nanopore in our lab because uh, it's uh, well, it's affordable at least to uh, some labs. And uh, uh, we have the smaller one called Minion that is basically available just next to a computer. And their big promising is, uh, well, expensive, but it's still affordable. We did a few things with this um, new technology and we utilize its properties like it's very fast and uh, it you can um, sequence the whole molecule in one go and you can detect modifications on those things as well. And from the clinical um, demand point of view, we worked on a few things. Um, one of the paper we recently published is called uh, the development of so-called MTNGS or MTTGS. Basically, we improved from the current available MNGS for pathogen detection, but we replaced the DNA with RNA and the cDNA, which has even higher efficiency in terms of the proportion of microbiome to, to, uh, to the, the host. And also it uh, helps us to further reduce time in clinical diagnosis of pathogens. On the other hand, when we we are currently still living in the middle of the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, uh, we also, we now know that this pathogen is actually a virus, a RNA virus. And uh, if we put the viral or virus communities in, into the same level of uh, microbiome, like a bacteria, we have this complex or even more complex communities also in our gut, in our intestines, in the lungs and other parts, which, was very hard to um, characterize because their genome are small and there's no universal marker. However, with the physical enrichment and the fast sequencing, we could do this much faster and get a, a very full um, overview of uh, this uh, community. In, interestingly, after we developed this method, we looked at uh, uh, COVID patients uh, got and checked their virum. It turned out if you look at uh, 
healthy and healthy individuals and the patients, their volume are different. And if you look at the patients who have very, so they have severe symptoms versus those who are with slight symptoms or no symptoms at all, their volume are also very distinct. Distinct. What we learned after using mice model and uh, correlation anal analysis is that you, we have uh, quite a lot of these uh, uncharacterized viral members that uh, uh, correlate with the immune parameters of the host and worth investigating. So there might be some causal relationships between the status of virum and the, the overall status of uh, human immunology. Then these uh, um, very close uh, collaborations uh, with the clinic and the hospitals, we also help to understand a few uh, mechanistic uh, work or mechanisms in disease development or treatment. One example work was uh, together with uh, the um, autoimmune department who works on lupus, which is a typical autoimmune disease. And uh, there, are, um, there are many factors uh, participating in it. When we look at gut microbiome in the patients, we realize that how um, there are certain members who are enriched in the patients and uh, other, free, uh, other probiotic or healthy members are missing from the gut microbiome. And uh, with um, a lot of informatic, bioinformatic investigations, we could dig into the exact mechanism. So quite a lot of the microbes from the lupus patients actually come from the oral environment, so from our oral microbiome, and they encode a bunch of peptides that can mimic our own proteins, which if expressed in the gut could in induce auto um, antibodies, and that could contribute to the development of lupus as well. Here we first identify the target in microbiome uh, in the gut and trace its origin, and then it also provides a future um, diagnostic marker or treatment targets for this kind of disease. Another one is uh, sort of a collaboration with the traditional Chinese medicine, which incorporates a larger volume of different uh, experience on medicine and the, their, the disease they can treat. Here we focus on type 2 diabetes and uh, one of the old um, uh, component called Babarin. It's a new sort of it's a, it's an old drug with many new findings, and we found Babarin as an, the key component of many Chinese traditional medicine actually induce a significant change in the gut microbiome, and more importantly, the it induces improvement or the over um, the increase of butyrate producing bacteria. And the butyrate is one of the key metabolites that is beneficial for uh, on metabolic uh, diseases, including type 2 diabetes. And we didn't so stop there because when we learned from so many needs and so many issues in the clinics, uh, we start to also look at what we can do from our own perspective. That is the work of uh, um, our third direction, which is utilization. Basically, we try to identify the large reservoir of bioactive molecules using bioinformatic approach, more specifically artificial intelligence. So one of the examples we have as the first success story is we tried to look at uh, uh, the new component called, or a very common component called uh, antimicrobial peptides. Some of them can be transformed or modified into new drugs. And uh, before, this had to be done experimentally because their sequence had no similarity and uh, there's uh, basically no tool to identify them with a high efficiency. But with the neural network, this can be done with a very high accuracy, uh, over 90%. And experimentally, we can we synthesize basically around 200 different peptides and 180 of them turn out to be active. In overall, we have more than 80% of the uh, success rate. More importantly, a few of them, roughly 10 of them, are very effective against multi-drug resistance uh, gram-negative bacteria, which has had no active drug or new drug in the last 40 years. 
and uh, a few peptides of ours can is very effective even in most models. This work is currently in the second round of minor revision at Nature Biotech, and we hope it can get accepted uh, very soon. From there, we even extended our analysis to so-called colitoxin, basically anti-cancer substance in microbiome that has been known for over a century, but it hasn't been, hasn't been systematically studied. With the AI and big data, we could actually mine uh, two different kinds of colitoxin. One is peptide, and the other is uh, the microRNA. So far, we were successful in identifying more than 40 different molecules that are super effective in cell models, and we are in the progress of working on the uh, animal test uh, in testing their efficacy in uh, treating cancer. So uh, here is a very short uh, summary and acknowledgement uh, in, um, for our work, we have uh, quite a good few good collaborators in Europe as well as in within China, and we also had uh, um, quite a lot of different uh, departments funding to get this done. But the central idea is uh, quite simple. We try to connect big data with biology and try to mine useful targets, useful um, diagnostic markers, as well as products from this kind of uh, huge amount of data. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Wang. <clears throat> uh, your presentation is really uh, impressive and also many thanks for your good control of time. Um, before we step into the next speaker, I uh, kindly ask all the audience to uh, switch on your cameras to show the respect to the, to the keynote speakers. And also, meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can you can just type your questions in the chat box so the presenters can answer you in the chat box as well. Due to uh, for the sake of time, we are not going to have the uh, online uh, Q and A uh, uh, steps. So the next keynote speaker is Professor Qian Junbin. Professor Qian uh, started from uh, 2009 to 2014 as a PhD candidate in the Department of uh, Molecular Cell Biology in Cairo Leuven. And uh, then he joined the Georgian University and became a research professor. And now he's a doctoral supervisor as well. Uh, professor Chen has expertise in the starting of the pathogenesis of uh, critical, uh, critical diseases, developing the early uh, diagnosis uh, biomarkers uh, strategy for the clinical trial-based treatment uh, stratification by single cell multi-omics uh, sequencing. So now uh, it's your, uh, all yours, uh, Professor Jim, please. Hi everyone. Thanks for the uh, kind intro introduction. And it's my pleasure actually to introduce about the single cell technology. Uh, actually I'm a PhD and a, a, VA, uh, and a postdoc in K11 VIB and, uh, and just went back to uh, China to start my own group uh, last year. So everything is, is still fresh here. Um, here, I want to introduce you cell, single cell technology because it's a really, really great innovation. And here I give you an analogy. It's actually from our uh, fruit plate. So traditionally we just blend it and then goes to the uh, uh, juice and then we just taste it, the, the, uh, the, the, the very, very vague of, of idea of what's inside but then it's it's more more than art than than the science but now with this technology innovation we can really sort this um, fruit into different categories and then find out really what what which one actually is is in problem and then this problem can cause other problems to other uh, types of fruits so basically it becomes a, a classic um, physics upgraded to atomic physics or even relativity so to me, it's actually a kind of revolution in the increase of dimensionality. So uh, this technology is being uh, uh, excuse me, it's not moving. Okay, now it's going. Okay, this technology is advancing actually uh, rapidly every year from 2009. It's really single cell. We can only assay one cell at a time. 
uh, with our mouse tube, but now it's been scaling up every year. So now actually we can uh, assay 1 million cell at a time. Even we can incorporate more dimension like the spatial dimension is also incorporated into the single cell sequencing field. Um, you can see that more and more papers published every year and that's really a, a, a booming uh, technology. So the idea here is simple that you can take out your tissue, our liquid biopsy, and then get into this uh, single cell suspension. And then for each cell types, you can assay different modality or so-called multi-omics. So most of the time we can assay this RNA expression, but actually in the same time, you can uh, concomitantly uh, also look at DNA methylation promoting accessibility. For instance, this EC seq technology, can assay in the same time four different modalities. So it's really powerful too. And its application is not limited to basic research from animal to, to IPS to organoids, but actually more interesting, or at least we are more interested in the disease. So by comparing the healthy and the disease tissue, we want to actually look into the mechanism of this pathology and to have new diagnosis and new target for treatment. Uh, today, I will just give you several examples to, to show how to use single cell sequencing technology to, to do research uh, from basic perspective and then translate into the uh, clinical interpretation. The first one is actually the COVID-19. Uh, we know that actually the virus can infect our lung and then our host have the viral uh, response, but then in the same time, it will accumulate inflammatory response eventually. Uh, for most people, it will keep some mild uh, symptom, uh, eventually recover, but uh, to certain percentage of people, they go to critical status and even die. Uh, but then we don't know what's the critical part to, to how to say, to dis discriminate this to uh, fate. And to, to do this, we actually uh, profile the immune landscape of this lung fluid. Basically, we take first the lung fluid from the patient and then pass this to the 10x genomic single cell platform. And we assay like three modality, which is the RNA itself and TCR sequence and BCR sequence. So single cell is very good at classify different cell types of these annotations. Here, as you can see from this figure, each small dots actually represent one single cell. When these dots are very close, to the other one, and they are belonging to same cell type. So we can here see at least 18 different cell types. Uh, so we can do a quantitative comparison if uh, certain cell types is more abundant in certain physiological, uh, physiological or pathological condition. For instance, the COVID-19 patient, they have very high level of neutrophils in their lung fluid, and uh, but there's low uh, alveolar macrophage. When you compare the mild and critical disease, you see that alveolar macrophage is still very low in the critical disease, suggesting this is a key uh, pathological uh, aspect. And we look at not only the quantitative data, but also look at the qualitative changes. For instance, uh, what changed if the COVID patient uh, happened and, and their immune system is responsive to that? So uh, here we just give one example for CD8 T cells we can actually uh, monitor their differentiated status, status. So for instance, CD8 T cell can differentiate into three lineage, the CD8 TRM, CD8 TMRA, and the CD8 TX. They are different in lineage and each lineage actually is with different functions. For instance, uh, for the TRM lineage, we can see that, uh, so for this purple color is a mouth uh, disease and the critical disease is the yellow one. So, so TRM, you have better differentiation in TRM for the mild patient, uh, but for the critical patient, you have higher differentiation for the TEX lineage, suggesting TRM actually is a protective cell type or differentiation lineage, while TX is uh, ex exacerbates the disease severity. And when we look at the TCR level, because when the T cell expand, the TCR richness will decrease. And when we look here, actually we see the TRM. Uh, in the mild disease, they have huge decrease in the TCR richness, and suggesting the antigen-specific TCR actually uh, increase and expand, which is protective. 
Okay, and then we also see a mini signature that was changed or dampened, especially for the interferon response. For these three major type of immune cells, the critical disease have much lower level of interferon response. And we don't really know the reason, but we also in the same time see that the plasma cell, which uh, express antibodies, is much more abundant in the critical disease. Uh, but that's strange because normally antibodies protect us against the COVID. And now if you have more critical disease, you have more antibodies. So some antibody must be bad. And then in later two studies, they show two mechanisms that is uh, describing these two bad antibodies. First one, actually some antibody can cover the surface of immune cell and then stop the interfering response signaling. And another type of bad antibody is actually the autoantibody against type one interferon. So in actually 10% of such a severe patients, they develop this autoantibody to block its own interferon. So that's why the interferon response is lower. And we can not, uh, we can not only see, look at the, the, the RNA, but also uh, the RNA of the cell itself, but also look at the viral uh, RNA because some cell, either they are infected by the virus or some cell actually they uh, eat virus and then to clean virus, for instance, immune cells. Indeed, using a existing uh, tool, actually we develop a little bit more to, to accommodate our new purpose. Uh, for instance, we develop, uh, we look at the uh, SARS-CoV-2 counts. We see actually not only the epithelial cell having uh, uh, the, 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 viral counts, but also the immune cell like myeloid and lymphocyte, they also have the viral counts. And then we, for the first time, uh, look at the differential expression of 11 viral genes and look at their uh, uh, abundance. We see that this S gene is more abundant in, in the epithelial cells and the N gene and of 10 gene are more abundant in the lymphocyte and the myeloid cells. So just in this uh, different gene have different mechanisms. For, uh, uh, for the pathological process. So when we look at here, for instance, the epithelial cells, when they are expressing S genes and their interferon response is being dampened. And that makes sense because virus will actually stop the uh, propagation uh, of, of the epithelial cells. And for neutrophil cells, when they are having this N, and definitely they will have more uh, interferon response. So in the same time, we can also look at the microbiome. That's the field of uh, Professor Wang. Indeed, we collaborate with uh, his su uh, former supervisor, Professor uh, Yeron Rios. And we found that actually uh, for the bacteria, uh, the monocyte, monocyte derived macrophage and neutrophil, they are having more bacteria reads. And indeed, we found that uh, uh, COVID-19 patients have a distant uh, spectrum of bacteria in their lung fluid. And more importantly, we look at the uh, bacteria associated cell, and we see that when those cells are associated with bacteria, they are having more pro-inflammatory signals, suggesting this bacterial infection can also contribute to the disease severity. And finally, we can use single cell actually to identify the therapeutic targets. For instance, uh, the widely used uh, disomethone uh, that's actually used for the critical disease, and we find indeed they are uh, uh, a very good target because it targets at least two groups of cells in the same time. Of course, there's other target that's uh, in clinical test or not found. And in our study actually give new perspective on that. Okay, secondly, I want to talk about the pan cancer studies. So normally you know that tumor uh, is actually not only the cancer cell, but also the cell surrounding it. There's many types of the stromal cells. So what's the difference between these cell types and how different they're or how similar they are and what's the uh, clinical implications. So you can look at all different spectrum, but we selected four cell types to start with as our, our pan cancer study. So basically we have the lung tumor, colorectal tumor and the ovarian tumor, also breast tumor to start with. And then we build a stromal blueprint for uh, at least uh, six, eight type of stromal cell types. And we found among them 46 is shared and 22 is Oh, uh, is tumor specific. Okay, and what's the use of that? Of course, that's very good for the basic research to annotate cell types 
We use it for also immunotherapy interpretation. For instance, we take the melanoma data and we predict at least there's two other T cell population can predict the melanoma patient, uh, whether they are responsive or not responsive to immunotherapy. In the same time, we can also predict the just regular response for different tumors. For instance, this CD8 differentiary pathway, we can see that this LC is LUN. So LUN has a very good uh, differentiation in this lineage. And uh, ovarian has very low differentiation. And indeed, from the clinical data, we know that uh, the PD-1 treatment for lung is super, and for ovarian, most of the clinical trail failed. Okay, then we really go to the clinical trail, and we want to study whether this PD-1 treatment will work for uh, breast cancer or not. If it doesn't work, and why? We want to answer uh, such question, and also want to know the mechanism behind it. So PD-1 and PDL one treatment, that's something uh, we, we, we uh, take the approach to look at their early response because we actually start with a, a early breast cancer patient. We take a needle biopsy, we uh, sequence them with single cell, and then we give them nine days of anti-PD-1 treatment. After that treatment, we uh, resect the tumor. And then again, we also sequence the single cell. And then we compare. Uh, before treatment and after treatment, and within these nine days, what happens? So first of all, we want to know the drug targets. Normally, the T cell express PD-1 and other immune cell express PD-L1 or cancer cell express PD-L1. And we found that in, indeed the PD-1 is expressed in two cell types of T, and that's CD4 TEX and CD8 TEX. Uh, and indeed, their abundance really associated with with the uh, responder and non-responder. Uh, but surprisingly- Again, uh, we are a little bit behind the timeline, so you still oh, have sorry. half minutes. Okay, I will just go through this. So we also look at the mechanism of the response um, to identify more genes. Uh, of course, finally, we want to find the biomarker for, for patient specification. And actually, single cell is now already being used in directly making decisions for the patient. For instance, in this uh, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, it, the clinician can really use single cell to identify a target. And after treatment, you can see that uh, the patient recovered well. Otherwise, this patient just wait to die. So I think uh, in the near future, single cell will be directly involving in the clinical decision, and we are working on that. Finally, I would like to acknowledge my team and especially my collaboration in uh, Leuven, uh, especially my uh, su uh, supervisor, Dieter Lambert. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for a really uh, informative presentation. Due to the timeline, uh, I will step immediately to the next speaker, Professor Yuan Qiang, uh, who graduated and got his PhD from Ghent University in 2008. Uh, he's now a full professor in uh, the Central South University. Professor Yuan's uh, research uh, interest includes uh, the 3D printing concrete, biological behavior concrete, so cement-based materials, uh, and also durability on the concrete. Uh, so it's really, uh, he, he has a lot of uh, concrete, uh, interest in concrete. So now please, uh, Professor Yuan, for your presentation. We can not hear you, Professor Yuan. Sorry about that. Can, can you see my yeah, screen? No, yeah, no problem. Okay, that's good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chang Yuan from Central South University. I'm honored to be here, and thank you, Chen Kai, for your invitation. I obtained my PhD degree in 2009 from Ghent University. That's 12 years ago, quite a long time ago. And my topic is uh, cement-based materials for slab track of high-speed railway. I would like to first fill you in on some information about the development of high-speed rail in China. Then I'm gonna talk about cement-based materials for slab track. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on the China rail track system type three slab track and self-compacting concrete applied in this track. First part, 
background. 15 years ago, there was no high speed rail in China. I, I still remember 2006, I was first in Europe. I was shocked by the TGV, the high speed rail in, in Europe. And at that time, I, I was thinking, when my country will have high speed rail line. 15 years later, the high speed rail network is all over the country and most big cities are connected by high speed rail with running speed of 300 to 350 kilometers per hour. And in China, you know, high speed rail becomes the first transportation choice for people traveling. After 15 years, China has the biggest high speed rail network and account for 65% to 50% of the world total. And Chinese, you know, Chinese government like to make ambitious plan, always five years plan. And trillions of dollars will be invested in high speed rail. At that time, almost all big cities will be connected by high speed rail. And basically, there are two types of high speed rail technologies. One is real rail technology and magnetic levitation technology. Speaking of maglev technology, the first technology is in Shanghai. It's originated from Germany. Probably it's not that successful. Probably will be demolished. And it's said Japan will, will, will build a new high-speed rail maglev line and will open on 2027. And in Changsha, China, right here in my city, a low moderate speed maglev line already in commercial use. And today my talk, topic will be real rail technology. And this is the most used one all over the world. Traditionally, railway is built on many aggregates. We call it a ballast. Like in Belgium and in France, they build a high speed rail on ballast track. And they hit the running speed record of rail at 570 kilometers per hour. You know, in China, the highest the running speed is, guess what? It's 486 kilometer per hour. So it, it's still much lower than that. However, most countries, including Japan, Germany, China, we all use ballastless track. And uh, the ballastless track has been widely implemented all over the world, despite high initial investment and noise problems. It has obvious advantages over ballast track system, such as increased capacity and reduced maintenance and life cycle cost, reduce the number of track maintenance operations and thereby increase safety. Okay, part two uh, is about the cement-based materials. And Chinese company has developed three types of ballast list slab track. CRTS one, two, three slab track. CRTS one originated from Japan and has been used in China for over 2,000 kilometers. And CRTS-2 originated from Germany and has been used for more than 4,000 kilometers. And CRTS-3 is originated from China and will be used for the rest of the new lines in China. Pro probably uh, 20,000 kilometers, I don't know. And to your left, is CRTS slab one, CRTS one slab track, and to your right is CRTS two slab track, and the bottom is CRTS three. They are quite different in terms of structure, but the structure is not our topic today. We're going to talk about the major cement-based materials used in these structures. There, there are some special cement-based materials used in these structures. Look at this structure. On the top is the prefabricated steam cured concrete slab. And, and there is a cushion layer for slab tracks for CRTS1 slab track. A mortar with low elastic modulus is used as a cushion layer. And a CR mortar with high elastic modulus is used for CRTS2 type slab track. 
CRTS3 slab track. We don't use any asphalt. We just use self-compacting concrete as cushion layer. And CA mortar is a kind of asphalt modified cement and made, out, made up of cement emulsified asphalt, water, sand, and some chemical admixtures. CRTS1 and 2 CA mortar are different from each other in terms in terms of compositions and properties. They use different types of emulsified asphalt. The two important parameters are asphalt to cement ratio and water to cement ratio. Therefore, the mechanical properties and durability are different. You can see the compressive strength of CRTS one CL motor is very low, just 1.8 MPa. And due to asphalt cost, is much higher than cement, and CRTS one CA motor is more expensive than that of CRTS two CA motor. And CA motor is mixed by a customized uh, mixing chuck, so we can mix uh, CA motor along the high speed line and cast it immediately after mixing. And here I, I am. You can see that's like uh, ten years ago on the job site. Behind me and uh, under my feet are high speed red lines. Yeah, I was uh, at that time, I was responsible for the consultancy of CL motor. My duty is to help engineers to cast CL motor correctly and solve all the material, material related problems on the job site. And steam cured concrete is not a new technology in the construction of high speed rail. Many structural elements are prefabricated in factory. And steam curing is used for accelerating the production of elements for two reasons. One, better quality control. We build all the elements in factory so we can control the quality quite well. And faster building speed. The one day strength with steam curing can reach 14 day strength in normal curing. And this is the curing regime of concrete. So the curing temperature reaches around 60 degrees. And you can see the, the, the this is steam cured concrete. The slab is about seven to nine tons. And the box beam, you can see a, a big stuff is about 900 tons, uh, all made with steam cured concrete. This partly explains why China built high speed rail lines so fast. Normally, for a several hundred kilometer line, it takes seven to five years from design to complete. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna go to a, a more specific material. And this is the structure illustration of CRTS3 slab chart. From top to bottom are prefabricated slab, SCC layer, base concrete plate, and SCC is cast into the very thin chamber between slab and base plate, and SCC flows on the geotextile instead of concrete. Probably you will say it's just a normal concrete, not special at all. Let me explain a little bit. For co conventional SCC, the upper surface is open to atmosphere and a slight bleeding or bubble floating is allowed. It can be repaired by finishing process. However, in the case of seared space filling concrete, strong bonding between the upper surface and above slab is required and the bleeding and bubble floating is not allowed because they impair the interface bonding. What's more, the space is very narrow, flat and quite big. This makes it more difficult to cast. In addition, concrete flows on flexible geotextile -text and with heavily steel reinforcement. This increases the flow resistance of SCC. And in terms of the structure requirement, the property of hardened SCC were proposed the compressive strength, elastic modulus. A, com a comprehensive laboratory and a full-scale field test was carried out 
in my lab. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to discuss the specific test, just some important general ideas. We designed some special testing setup to simulate the flow of STC in sealed space. A test setup like this. We used the concrete equivalent motor in the test. After casting, check the surface quality by image analysis. For example, there is a big void in the picture, but the other area is good, obviously. obviously. The air is entrapped during casting. We should improve casting method to avoid the entrapped air. And this picture is full of small bubbles, and the bubbles may come from the air content of concrete. After casting, the air bubble rise up to the surface. In this case, we need to improve the mixed design or raw materials of concrete. We also conducted Lots of full-scale tests to check the surface quality and the interface bonding of SCC. These are, there, there are many failure examples. Look, the interface bonding is terrible and bleeding segregation you can see here. Sorry, uh, uh, Professor Yuan, uh, to yeah? interrupt you, you have for half a minute uh, because okay. we are already behind the time. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and after all the uh, work, we proposed the specification for the concrete and all the, the design principle of SCC. And the, this is the typical uh, mixture design of SCC. And this is, this is how we build the CRTS3 ballast bar slab track and how, how we cast concrete in the job site and this is this is this is the job site where we do how we do the uh, full scale test and the technology developed by central south university has been applied in high speed rail of uh, 1647 kilometer the number is still increasing so that's all thank you there are thank some. you. Thank you, yeah, Professor thank Yen. You. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we step into the next speaker, Professor Zhang Qilu. Uh, he did his PhD studies in chemistry uh, from 2010 to 2014 in Ghent University. And then he started postdoc in the University of Helsinki uh, before he joined the Jian, uh, Jiaotun University. Now he is a full prof uh, he is a BI, focused on design synthesis and the properties of soft nanoparticles, as well as the potential applications in energy and the biomedicine. So please, uh, Professor Zhang, uh, to welcome you to the, to the stage. So you have 12 minutes and you will hear a notification at minutes 10. Right, thank you. Thank you, Kay, for your very kind introduction. So my name is Chi Lu Zhang. Uh, I graduate from Ghent University in the Department of Chemistry, Organic Chemistry and Macromolecular Chemistry. Uh, now working in Xi'an Jiaotun University. So basically I'm now working uh, mainly on functional polymers based on nano-sized soft particles. So, uh, here I actually uh, view in this section, I will uh, in show you a little bit of work that I have recently done in my group. Uh, so the inspiration of this work is the uh, uh, protein functionality and the protein structure. As we have seen this picture of, as we all know that proteins always contains various of subdomains to serve for different functionality. Uh, so uh, as a polymer chemist, we peop, a lot of people are trying to mimic the structure and the functionality of uh, proteins. So we know that for proteins, there is there are only about 20 monomers that can have a lot of uh, functionalities, uh, but for polymers, we usually, uh, we actually have numerous of monomers, but only uh, uh, with very limited functionality. So when we uh, study the uh, structure of protein, we find out that usually there are a lot of uh, subdomains that, are, that is uh, fixed uh, in a 
preformed structure. For example, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, for example, in this uh, uh, hemoglobin that you have uh, uh, some alpha sub subunits that can uh, have the uh, a catalytic uh, effect. So in this case, scientists, uh, especially polymer scientists, are trying to mimic the multifunctional structure of protein to use, uh, for example, a triplock copolymer, as you see on the left side of the screen. And then you have a triplock copolymer with a fluoride block, uh, a aliphatic block, and a hydrophilic, or we, or we also call it a, a soluble block in water. So when this, when you throw this polymer uh, in a, a in a good way uh, in water, then it forms uh, uh, a a kind of so-called multi uh, compartment nanoparticles. Or in another way, you can have a linear triplock copolymer, and you have A, B, C blocks with different uh, solubility, and then you uh, you allowed it to uh, to self-assemble in a no solvent for B block, and then you form a micelles. Then you change the so the uh, condition of uh, the solvent. Then you are able to have uh, make some kind of uh, uh, amphibian. A different shape of uh, blocks, then you can further self-assemble into uh, multi-compartment nanoparticles. Uh, those techniques look looks very good, but usually, if you have uh, a triplock copolymer, then usually the structure, the result structure of multi-compartment nanoparticles, are not so stable. Then it tends to uh, be dissolved again in, when you dilute it, or when the polymer nanoparticle uh, has catch has been uh, forced uh, undergo some force. So, what we are trying to do, we try to uh, develop a new way that you can we can mimic the structure of a protein. So we uh, go back to the self assembling of protein. So for example, uh, usually a protein has a primary structure, what we, we call it polypeptide, and then it self-assembling to secondary stru structure like a, a beta sheet or up helix. Then further, uh, it forms a tertiary structure. This tertiary structure already have some functionality, and then uh, this tertiary structure finally form quantum structure, a uh, real protein. So when we, find out this, we are trying to uh, mimic, we, we, want, we wonder that if we can already prepare uh, nanoparticles or prepare a polymer that can directly mimic the tertiary structure, we jump the first and second structure, uh, directly go to a tertiary structure. So we find out that uh, a star polymer with a lot of arms can serve as this uh, uh, functions. So uh, in, for example, in this case, the blue part here can be a, a hydrophobic part, which can uh, serve as some functionality. And this, the outside can be hydrophilic or water soluble can protect this uh, uh, structure, for example, in water. And then we uh, attach a very long uh, polymer chain that you can have a amphiphilic structure of this polymer, and then we allow it to self-assemble into uh, for uh, maybe some kind of uh, multi-compartment nanoparticles. So here I will uh, report two examples. The first is uh, a multi-compartment nanoparticles with hydrophilic domains. Usually, uh, if we have a polymer self-assembly, you can hardly have uh, hydrophilic domains in, in the polymer in the uh, result self-assembly structure uh, because the hydrophilic usually part usually uh, migrate outside of the to form the shell of the particles in water. So, so here we design a polymer uh, as you see on the right side. This polymer structure has uh, this blue part polyacrylic acid and the uh, uh, oh, the outside we have polystyrene to protect this uh, hydrophilic part, and then a linear polyacetylene glycol to 
introduce some, uh, to induce the self-assembly. Then we uh, have three step, uh, we use a three step polymerization and uh, mo modification. And we have a series of polymers, those are very well uh, catalyzed. And then we allowed it to self-assembly uh, in water. Basically we first uh, dissolve this polymer in, in, in an organic solvent and then we, we slowly add water inside this solution and based on the uh, structure of the polymer that we able to form, uh, for example, a multi-compartment uh, micelles, uh, which you see on this screen, the uh, uh, model of the nanoparticles. Here you have the blue part as the hydrophilic part and the yellow part as the hydrophobic part. Uh, in this case, we can already call it a multi-component nanoparticles. Uh, while tuning the structure of the polymer, we were also able to have uh, to make uh, a the the hollow structures, uh, which we call the multi-component uh, vesicles, and we also have hydrophilic domains and hydrophobic domains. And then uh, we also able to form. Uh, uh, a, a string, string uh, shape of the multi-compartment nanoparticles with alternatively, alternatively uh, the uh, uh, blue part and the uh, yellow part. And the, sec uh, the second work is the crystalline multi-compartment nanoparticles for drug delivery. Why we want to do this? Because uh, in the previous uh, uh, previous work, we found out that such polymer structures are not so stable in water against dilution. So we actually design a polymer with a, a crystalline polylactic acid to allow it, it crystallize to form a very stable nanoparticles. And we, uh, we hope that such particles can be very stable against the dilution and uh, uh, against the strain shearing so, so that it can might, might be able to uh, uh, deliver some drugs for application. So this, uh, so we first prepare a lot of polymers and then we uh, allow it to self-assembly into various uh, structures like plates or spheres. So we then, then we try to load uh, model molecules like uh, uh, Nile red in the plates or spheres, then we, we find that it, the loading is quite successful. And with then collaboration with uh, Professor Zhu Yezhang, who will present later, uh, we are able to uh, allow this uh, uh, nile red loaded nanoparticles into a cell, into a cancer cell. Then we can see uh, from this uh, uh, picture, we can see that such particles can be uh, success successfully loaded in in the cell. So uh, to conclude, we actually have been inspired by the self-assembling of uh, protein that we are able to have make a series of multi-compartment nanoparticles. Uh, those nanoparticles uh, have different uh, uh, subdomains, and uh, in the next stage, we are trying to. Uh, to use those nanoparticles to deliver some drugs to allow it to, to release in body. Uh, finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chilu, uh, for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, it's a pity that we don't have time to discuss. So the next or and the last key, uh, keynote speaker is Professor Zhang Zhiyue. He obtained his PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from Ghent University uh, in 2016. And then he did also the, his uh, postdoc in the same field. Uh, he joined Shandong University and now has many engaged in the design and the development of pharmaceutical carrier materials and the multifunctional nano drug delivery system. So please, uh, Professor Zhang, to present your okay. talk. Okay, thanks a lot for, for, the, for the invitation and the, the, the introduction. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Julia Zhang from uh, Shandong University at uh, the Department of Pharmaceuticals. Today, my topic is raft polymers for, for drug delivery system. So 
uh, just want to a simple introduction. I was a graduate from Shannon University uh, at 2012 and then uh, went to uh, Belgium to, to, to get the, the PhD degree from the 2012 and the to, uh, 2016. And then uh, after two years of postdoc training, I uh, went back to, to Shannon University as a, as a professor. And now my research interest uh, includes two, actually inc includes three parts. One is novel drug carriers. Second one is nanoparticular drug delivery system. And the final one is the combina combination uh, anti-tumor therapy. Um, yes. Okay, uh, so now I work, I focus on the design of known polymers and then uh, use the polymers for the drug delivery system and then for the uh, anti-tumor comb combination therapy. So this is my research group. And uh, because I just uh, uh, went back to China uh, three years, so my group is still uh, quite small. So uh, the polymers for drug delivery actually uh, has been developed in uh, uh, for for more more than uh, yeah six years, but the first paper reported by uh, Rob Longer uh, for the polymers uh, for the sustained release of proteins and other macro molecules in nineteen seventy six. After that, the polymers uh, for the drug delivery has been developed very well. So today, I want to introduce the raft polymerization raft polymerization. Raft polymerization just use monomer uh, and uh, the chain transfer agent to uh, do the polymerization. And then because the uh, um, polymer has a, a sulfur end group, so it can bind to the uh, gold nanoparticle surface be bind, uh, by the gold sulfur uh, containing. So today, my, the contents for the, uh, the topics for the, the today is uh, including uh, three parts. First one is the engineering, the interaction between polymer coated gold nanoparticles and the living cells. So the cellular uptake of gold nanoparticles can be influenced by the size, shape, and the surface chemistry of gold nanoparticles. But then the hydrophobicity of polymer coating, uh, whether it includes the, the cellular uptake of gold nanoparticles, is not uh, investigated. So we just uh, use the we just uh, developed the three. Uh, several a series of uh, polymers including different ratios of hydrophilic uh, hydrophobic mm, uh, here monomer and uh, the hydrophilic uh, hydrophobic uh, mere, uh, mere. so with increasing the, the ratio of mere, the polymers become very very hydrophobic so then the uh, gold nanoparticles was surface uh, was synthesized by the reduction of a uh, good sort and then the polymers was uh, anchored on the surface by ligand exchange so to investigate the, the, the cellular uptake of organic particles, we developed a new flow cytometric gating strategy to quantify the, the cellular the organic particles inside the cells. So we can see this with increasing the, the, uh, the concentration of organic particles, more organic particles can be uptaken by the cells. So we just uh, want to uh, investigate the hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobicity of coating uh, good nanoparticles can influence the uh, cellular uptake. So we can see this is this, in, uh, this result with increasing the hydrophobic uh, hydrophobicity of uh, polymer coating, more nanoparticles can be uptaken by the cells. So we, we, just, we, we are not sure whether the, our results are uh, uh, successful, so we will use the, the, uh, another method uh, we call um, SP mass to to quantify the, the amount of gold nanoparticles inside. So the results are similar. So we can conclude that the, the, the facts, the facts uh, strategy can be uh, successful in determining the cellular uptake of gold nanoparticles. The TM imaging also confirms the, uh, the, uh, hydro, the more hydrophobic, hydro, hydrophobic coating, the more gold nanoparticles can be uptaken. So the first two, the, the uh, first conclusion is the hydrophobicity of polymer coating of nanoparticles determines the extent of cellular uptake of polymer coated nanoparticles. The second topic is engineering the interaction between polymer coated nanoparticles and the influenza virus. So this one, the, this one, the, the green one is, a, is a, the TMA meeting of influenza virus and the surrounding is the nanoparticles. 
they also use the, the same uh, method actually. Because the influenza virus uh, has a, a hemoglobin on the surface, and the hemoglobin can bind to the salicylic acid on the surface of like a, a red blood cells. So we just want to sh to de develop a sign a good name particles with uh, salicylic acid on the surface to determine to, to to investigate the interaction. So the first one, the first part is the polymer synthesis. We also use the raft polymerization to polymerize. The, the HPMA and APMA. Because APMA has an amino group which can bind to the, uh, uh, the lactose by the reduction amination. So in this case, the, the, the celiac, acid, celiac acid group can bind to the, the polymers. We use this to alpha 2,6 uh, and also the next, the, the, uh, the polymers were the anchored on the surface of the particle like the, uh, uh, like the, the previous uh, topic. And uh, first, we rejected, uh, we investigated uh, the gonad particle in, in interaction with lactins because we use the two, uh, two six, uh, two, alpha 2,6 two silly lactose. And the two, uh, two six uh, lactose can bind to the SNA specifically, but, uh, um, uh, but the two, uh, two three silly lactose cannot bind to the uh, uh, MAA. So we just first do, do the DLS. DLS analysis and uh, to uh, to check the size the size increase of net gonad particles. In this case, if the gonad particle bind to the SNA, the increase of net particles can increase. Uh, sorry, the size of gonad particle increase. So uh, the control uh, the net particle cannot increase with the MAA. So next, we detected and we uh, tested the gonad particles interaction with virus. Because the gonad particles has a size of like 50 nanometers, but the virus has two, 200 nanometers. If we mix them together, we found two peaks. The first one it should be the, uh, the suspended gonad particles, and second one we, 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 we think that it could be the binding of the gonad particles and the virus. So we also checked the TM and found that the, the gonad particles was, on, was anchored on the surface of the virus. Uh, the control the the the, uh, the glycan polymers without the selecto, selec, selec, uh, acid cannot bind to the virus. So the gonad particle functions functionalized with polymers containing selec acid chain can bind to the surface of virus specifically. The second topic is the design of novel thermal sensitive rock polymerization. We know the uh, uh, LC acid polymer which has a lower uh, uh, lower critical solution uh, temperature. That means if the temperature is about the LCST, the polymeric nanoparticles collapse with a partially released drug. Uh, as a control, if we use the UCST polymer as for the drug carriers, if the if its temperature is increased, uh, is about the UCST, the polymer nanoparticles can disassemble with the completely released drug. But uh, normally, the UC but uh, actually the UCST polymer cannot be used in the uh, uh, in the carrier of the drug delivery because some uh, use, some UCST polymers are too sensitive to the uh, to the polymer uh, chains to the ions and also some polymer uh, has uh, UCST behaviors only up, uh, only up, uh, expect the UCST in the um, mixture of uh, like solvent uh, and with the, the DMSO also the uh, the water so we, we invest, in this case we investigated the we want to design a uh, uh, UCST polymer that can be uh, sensitive to the uh, the uh, to the uh, to the physical uh, conditions. Like in this case, the polymers can release can be uh, reversibly uh, can 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 show the reversible uh, the UCST behavior and then can be hydrolyzed to the uh, the prior previous to previous hydro, hydro, to the previous polymers. This is the monomer synthesis uh, route because we use the, the, the monomer or HPME and then the HPME was functionalized with the GE. And then the monomer was polymerized by raft. Okay, this is the final polymers and because the uh, polymer has a carbo carbonate uh, group, it can be hydrolyzed to the poly HPME. The poly HPME is quite used, quite uh, it's frequently used in the drug delivery care uh, system. So we first we investigated the uh, the 
Yeah, some more sensitive. So uh, because uh, from this picture, we found that at, a, at 60 degrees, the polymer solution is uh, transparent. But after when we cool down the uh, temperature to 25 degrees, the, poly the polymer solution became turbid. And then after heating cooling uh, cycles, the, the polymers had the thermal sensitive properties. And then we checked the, the different uh, characterizations. And I found that at pH 7.4, the, the polymers still had the UCLT behaviors. So we have Next one minute left. left. We okay. have a one minute left. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next, we checked the LCST polymers for the um, uh, for in, encapsulation of hydrophilic hydrophilic BSFs and hydrophobic red or not red, and found that only uh, hydrophobic uh, only uh, hydrophobic niles not red can be encapsulated into the polymers. But for the UCLT polymer, the polymer can encapsulate encapsulate uh, hydrophilic phase BSA and hydrophobic not red. So we, we also do it in the in, in the in the animal in the mouse, and we found that the 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 uh, the phase BSA can be uh, spent could be uh, released suspendedly. So the the conclusion three is the a synthetic uh, transparent uh, translationally thermal responsive from polymer with UCLT behavior within the physiological relevant windows was designed. So to include to include the rough polymers can be a great interactive materials which can interact with the living cells and the influenza virus in an interesting way and can be an excellent drug delivery carriers. Okay, uh, thank you so much and uh, welcome to Shenzhen University. Thanks a lot, uh, Zhi Yue. Uh, although we have really limited time for the keynote speakers, but uh, let's give a round of applause uh, to all the five keynote speakers for their informative and impressive uh, presentations. Now uh, we are uh, switching to the second bullet. Uh, we have invited three guests uh, to the round table interview. Uh, professor Desmets uh, is a full professor in the Faculty of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences at Ghent University member of the Belgium Royal Academy of Medicine, member of the European Academy of Sciences. Professor Huang uh, started uh, pharmaceutical sciences in uh, Professor Desmet's group and got his PhD in 2011. And then he did his uh, postdoc at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne. Uh, since 2013, he became a professor uh, in the 1943 uh, university. Professor Xiong uh, obtained his PhD in the same group uh, in 2017. And now he is also a professor uh, at the 1940s University. So the three professors have built up and been uh, supervising a joint laboratory of advanced biomedical materials between the 1940s University and Ghent University for years. The laboratory has been fruitful in both scientific research and talent developments. So now we are inviting uh, Professor Desmet uh, to give us a short introduction to the laboratory. Please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I try to share my screen first. Yeah. <clears throat> can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. That's fine. Okay, so, so thank you very much for your kind uh, invitation to shortly uh, introduce you to our joint uh, laboratory. So it's a joint lab between the uh, Nanjing Forest University in Nanjing and the University of Ghent. Um, so tell me, let me first um, tell you a bit about the beginning of this lab. And actually the very beginning is, that's, let's call it the official start which was around spring 2019, when so a delegation from the, the uh, Nanjing University actually visited us uh, in Ghent uh, uh, in 2019. And then some months later, actually, we had the real official start uh, when the, the vice rector of Ghent uh, University actually uh, joined us in Nanjing and signed this kind of official collaboration between Nanjing University, uh, Forest University and New Ghent. So this is the official start, but let me first tell you a bit more about the real start. And in fact, the real start of this joint lab, it goes back almost 15 years ago. 
when um, a very young student uh, contacted me um, and asked me whether he could join me as a PhD student uh, in Ghent. <clears throat> and um, of course, this was Chao Bo Wang, uh, who is now the, the, the professor in the Nanjing Forest University. And actually, you know, since 2007, so uh, Chobo, of course, studied to stud he st st started to study with us. And, uh, you know, uh, we became good friends, so to say, as you can see here, uh, he's in my home on the occasion of Christmas in 2007, I guess, uh, a few months after he arrived in Belgium. Um, so Chobo, he also became the president of the Chinese Students Association in Ghent University. Here you see him together with the rector of the university and also together with the ambassador of China uh, in Belgium, and at the right side you have, uh, you see, uh, Professor Chabo Wang on the occasion of his doctoral defense in 2011 in Ghent. And important is that after he finished his uh, doctoral defense in 2011, he moved to Switzerland. But as you can see, we we kept we, we kept on we kept our relations, so we stayed in contact. Because often when people leave the lab after PhD, you lose contact. But the point is that we kept contacts. So. Job, he came back again in 2015 on the occasion of celebration. I went to visit him in China. And even you can see in 2018, so he got his first child and his name was Paul, given Paul uh, after, and his name was given, Paul was, the name of Paul was given after, let's say, the name of my brother, who actually died the year before. So just to tell you uh, how close uh, our uh, friendship is and how close our yeah, collaboration is. So why do I tell you this little story? Because in the end, you have to realize that such a kind of joint lab as we have it today, it goes back to a young person having an interest in a professor in 2007, in the work of a professor on the one hand, and a professor being interested in a young student, like Chaobo in 2007. So it's about having a kind of common interest about willing to work together, willing to start to work together, and willing to walk together. And so that's the real origin of our joint uh, laboratory uh, 50 years ago. So I will tell you a little bit about the current status to give you a short idea on this. And so, um, so this is our lab in Nanjing. So it's a 500 meter squared lab. Uh, I even have an office there. Of course, it's a long time. I have been in my office now <laughs> in Nanjing. Um, so this is more or less the group picture. Uh, it's, a, it's a group picture of, uh, I guess, two years ago. But we have, of course, a number of PhD students and master students uh, in the lab and postdocs. So important as well, or an important milestone as well, is the fact that, you know, uh, at the right side of me, you can see uh, Dr. Huak Chiong, <clears throat> so Ram Huak Chiong. Um, so he recently joined the joint lab in January 2021 as a new professor, which is an important milestone from our, for our joint lab. And so let me just introduce you to uh, Ram Hua. So he uh, joined uh, our lab in Ghent as a PhD student. And actually after that, he, um, he indeed realized to get a postdoc uh, a scholarship from the FWO, which is the most prestigious uh, scholarship uh, for postdoctoral research in Belgium. Hmm? So he stayed as a postdoc. Uh, and then finally, he left us in the end of 2020 to become a professor uh, in 2021 in NG. And you know, I'm very glad to say that uh, Hua has been very successful in Belgium. So here, for instance, he got the award of this, the BERT, which is this, the very well-known uh, association of industrial companies uh, on R&D in Belgium. And uh, he got the award from them. And at the right side, you see that this award was delivered to him actually by the King of Belgium in uh, 2018. So just to express my knowledge and my, my strong appreciation for all the achievements of Hua, while he was for 10 years in Ghent with us. So what are the research disciplines? And so, you know, in Ghent, we are working on nucleic acids as new biotherapeutics to cure modern, uh, of, course, of course, numerous diseases in the future. So we deal with mRNA, DNA delivery, uh, siRNA delivery. So our group in Ghent is a multidisciplinary group. And so we are doing nanotechnology, biophysics, cell biology, biophysics as well for clinical and clinical work. And so actually in the field of nanotechnology for this, the polymers, for the materials, and also in our biophysics work, when it comes to the use of light, we actually collaborate with Chaobo and with this Hua and with the people in the joint lab in Nanjing. So <clears throat> the current activity, so what we do, uh, of course, you know, 
in normal times, I make summer visits to Nanjing to give lectures. And so I did it for a couple of times. So we have joint PhD students. So our next student will uh, <coughs> defend, defend his PhD in Ghent and in Nanjing in 2021, in the end of 2021. We applied for joint research applications like at FWO. And of course, we also make joint research publications. And I'm very glad, for instance, to tell you the most recent ones. So here, <clears throat> we have a very recent publication uh, from our joint lab, where we actually designed the kind of polymer films which can be activated by light and which we are uh, invest investigate for the delivery of nucleic acids into the surface of the eye. Yeah? So it's a recently published work. And also very last week, actually, so we had our publication, Nature Nanotechnology, on a new type of material. So these are electrospin fibers, which we actually can activate by light for the transfection of all kinds of cells, especially for T cells in the context of T cell therapy. So we, here we have kind of joint activity on material design for biological purposes. And I'm very glad as well. So here we have also Ron who was the first author of the paper. This was the end of his stay in Belgium, I would say. And here, so uh, we also have actually, uh, based upon that work, we have also installed recently a spin-off uh, at Ghent University. So we have been very, very collaborative and very produ uh, productive, you know, in our relationship with this, uh, our Chinese friends. So which are the added values? Very short. So of course, I try to support the research of F and of you. I try you know, to, to, you know, to, uh, <clears throat> sorry to expose, of course, the students to English lectures, which is important as well, because of course, English remains a quite big challenge for many students in China. Of course, I try to bring some financial support to the group, visibility in China. I try to use my network. I'm editor of the GCR, which is the main journal in the field. And of course, I try to use my network to offer it to my colleagues in China as well, and to, to facilitate you know, the, their work, their scientific work as well. Of course, we offer them to send students to EU, and of course, we <clears throat> keep our relations and friendship. And what is the added value from my side, the way I feel is that I have a gate to China. And so it's very important to stress that because China is a big country. So for Belgian and European scientists, it remains a big country and sometimes very difficult to find your way. So for me, it's a kind of gate to China. So Chaobo and Huao helping with me. <clears throat> so to build a Chinese network, of course, also to apply for dedicated funding from EU with Chinese partners. And as you can see here, so most important for me is that I enjoy the friendship, as you can see at the bottom of this slide. Um, and, you know, uh, this is something I really want to stress that uh, I enjoy this friendship, this collaboration with uh, Chobo, with Hua, with the students very much there. Um, of course, that's real life. And so it's about traveling, about visiting each other, and, but it's also about enjoying each other. And we have already joined a lot of activities, a lot of pleasant moments together, both in Belgium uh, as well as in China. I'm very grateful that strong collaboration that is very productive. And I would like to thank the whole group there in Nanjing, let's say, for this nice opportunities we, uh, we get from them. <clears throat> and I hope I can visit you very soon. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really uh, nice uh, introduction to the uh, laboratory. Uh, to my understanding, the joint laboratory is kind of uh, a son of the Professor John Bo. I, I think that's also uh, a good uh, collaboration examples between the University of Ghent and the 1943 University. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, what were the challenges or difficulties in the very beginning when you uh, really want to build up such kind of joint laboratory? Do, did you have any difficulties or uh, challenge to, to overcome? <clears throat> So maybe Chabo, you can and Huawei, you can first comment on that. I can then continue. Yes, okay. Uh, Stefan, thank you very much. Uh, my voice is clear. Yes. That's that's good. Thank you very much. First of all, for your presentation, it taught me a lot um, because I didn't speak English for quite a long time. So if I can speak in Chinese, I can show more about the, what I feel in now. But now the English is not good uh, than before. So uh, anyway, I'm quite uh, happy and uh, impressed uh, by your presentation. Uh, everything we did, we did <clears throat> before is a friendship. Uh, this is the I and the Hua field. Friendship is the, is the base for everything, of course, including research cooperation. Uh, I think, uh, one word that is quite impressed me 
during my public defense. Uh, in 2011, December 2nd, uh, on my public defense, you told me we are friends and even uh, I'm your son in China. And uh, you can call me any, any uh, uh, you can call me uh, anywhere, any, any time, you know, without uh, anything about the uh, evening, early morning, everything like that. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, impressed. Uh, of <laughs> course, uh, this topic today, the topic uh, of the seminar is about uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, for including joint life between Chinese University and uh, Belgium University, of, uh, of course, uh, two partners. Uh, what we think, uh, what we think, what we did now is quite uh, success, uh, successful, I we think. Uh, as you showed in your presentation, the official uh, start is from uh, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, our president of Nanjing Forestry University visited Uganda in 2019, 2019, yes. yes. <clears throat> and uh, Stephen, you invited uh, our uh, president to have a, long, uh, have a lunch together with them. And uh, my president is quite uh, appreciate for that. After visiting to Europe, he told uh, us, uh, we should uh, get more cooperation between Uganda and uh, Nanjing Forestry University. After half year, I think in in, the, in uh, December, November, November, November. Uh, in November, uh, the vice uh, rector of Uganda uh, have a uh, visit to China, and then you you visit uh, together with her. Uh, in China, and then we signed uh, the official contract for our joint uh, lab. But of course, the joint lab is an open uh, platform for everything, uh, for student exchange, uh, research, uh, cooperation, everything, well, we, what we can do. Of course, including uh, funding application between Chinese, China, and uh, Belgium, or Flanders. Of course, it's quite useful for us uh or also we 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 did a lot based on joint lab we also do some uh, cooperation with the cosmetic company as you showed in your presentation ocean man it's a very famous uh cosmetic company in china uh the time is quite limited uh yeah, in summer yeah fr friendship is is everything it's very important because yeah. we have many colleagues in our <laughs> university, not everyone can have such kind of a joint lab. Uh, our joint lab is quite uh, successful between uh, me, Hua, and uh, Stephen, even Kevin together. Uh, friendship is quite uh, important. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, the most important thing. What, what do we think? Hua, maybe Hua can say something. Uh, yeah, we still have two minutes. Yeah, maybe Hua, yeah, two minutes. Uh, Hua to uh, give some comments on the outlook. What is the future of the joint uh, laboratory? What's your plan and what, what are your expectations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, you know, uh, so before, I think it's before the pandemic, we have already, so like uh, Stefan, they will visit uh, China for at least one time or even two times per year. But now uh, we only have uh, the, how's it, online meeting. Yes. So maybe after, after, on, after the pandemic, and we will start again, so it's, uh, we will invite uh, Stefan to come to China again. And the most important that I would next say, well, probably one of our students will, be, will go to uh, Stefan's can't. group uh, to, do, uh, to start the PhD uh, research. So that's it, uh, we will keep, uh, so it means we will keep this kind of uh, relationship with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Stefan's group and then we will make it uh, more and more intensive uh, cooperation. So in the future, so that is uh, my comments. I think okay. it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, so it's very, how say, as uh, Chao say, it's a friendship is very important. And the most important, that we, I think it's most important is we trust, trust each other. And I, I, you know, you know, when you do the, do the cooperation, 
So you should, you should adjust your plans. You should adjust your collaborator. Otherwise, you know, there's many, many conflicts between each other. So okay. And, say, and also some, one most important was to, uh, to, the, to the people who you would like to build the, uh, build the cooperation with your promoter or with your plans in Belgium or in other countries. So I think that's the most important you should keep in your mind. So Thank you. Thank you, Lianhua. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm afraid that we have to conclude here. Thank you all, Steph, Chabo, and Zhang. Yeah, Hua, we are we are quite happy. Yeah, we we yeah. we meet uh, many old friends today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really we, appreciate each other. Uh, uh, yes, ten years ago, you in Ghent. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate uh, for your uh, acceptance of the invitation and the preparation of the interview. And uh, I hope you will continue your, your success uh, with the joint laboratory and develop more talents for both countries. So to close this session, I would thank also the invited speakers again and uh, appreciate all the participants for your attendance. I hope you will further enjoy the next sessions on green building, which is hosted by my colleagues, Dr. Wang Ling. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.